Again, it's good to see you guys this morning. Hey, if you'll, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles or your Bible apps to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3. 2 Peter, chapter 3 is where we're going to begin this morning as we kick off our time. Really, we started a new series uh, called Heaven, A Glorious Future. And I've got really good news for you this morning. It's that in a world full of chaos and bad news that surrounds you, that, that you feel like overwhelms you, that kind of attacks you and attacks maybe, your, maybe your, your sense of sanity or stability in life, you have, if you know Jesus Christ, you have a glorious future ahead of you, that your future is incredibly bright because of who Jesus is and what he's done. And so you may ask the question, well, why are we take, taking a few weeks talking about heaven? Again, that is one of the constant unmovable, wonderful pieces of news that we have as Christians, to know that our future is secure, that we, we may not know what's going to happen tomorrow here on this planet, but we know that Jesus Christ holds our future. And so, again, why are we talking about heaven? Well, number one, because everybody is created. Everybody will spend eternity somewhere. And what you do with Jesus, whether you accept him as your Lord and Savior or whether you reject him as something other than that, that you will spend eternity somewhere. And second, the reason why we're talking about it is because eternity is closer than you think. That, it's, that eternity is closer than your next breath. That you could be, before you draw your next breath, you could be in the face-to-face -face presence of God standing before him that our next second is not promised. And so we want to take time talking about this good news, our future in Jesus Christ. And so here in this life, this world is not your home. We are simply journeying through this life to get to a better home, to get to a better place, a permanent place, a place that we were created for, a place that God has created for us. And talking about the kingdom of heaven Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is, is, is talking to the disciples, and they want to know about the kingdom. They say, how, how, what does it look like? What will heaven be like? How will we, be, how will we line up in heaven? Who's going to be the greatest and who's going to be the least? And they're asking all these questions about heaven. And Jesus tells the disciples, he brings in a small child, and he says this, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so what's amazing about helping us set up the way we're going to be talking about heaven today is that Jesus is sitting there, has his disciples, people are gathering around him. He brings in a small boy, and he says, if you want to know what it looks like to belong, to be a citizen of heaven, if you want to know what it looks like uh, to walk and to live and, 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 and to be there in heaven, look at this young boy. And what he meant by that is a couple of things. Number one, that a child is dependent upon their, on, on their parents. Uh, there, there's a real humble dependence that a child looks to mom or dad or a legal guardian for help. Also, there's a trust that happens, that children have a natural trust in, in authority figures uh, for the most part, especially when they're really small. And, and, uh, and third is that children have wonderful, wild imaginations. Uh, and the reason why that's great is, is because our brains maybe cannot comprehend uh, the beauty and the nature of heaven, the way that scripture tells us. And what's wonderful about a child is a child is able to create little worlds in their mind where the floor is lava and you can't touch it. Or the couch becomes the wrestling ring and the first guy to touch the floor has been eliminated, right? Or you play cops and robbers or whatever. Children have wild imaginations. And I'm afraid that as we've grown older, probably, probably because of the effects of sin in our hearts and minds, that we become older we become more calloused. We lose that imaginative spirit. And so this morning, throughout the scripture, I'm going to try to give to you five pictures of the beauty of heaven. We say, what is heaven going to be like? Well, last, week we last week, we talked about how God created us to walk with him, and it's going to be perfect and great, how sin ruined that, how Jesus has come to fix that, and how there's a, how there's a better future. Well, today... We're talking about what will heaven be like. How can we think about it? What does it mean? What is up ahead for us that is so wonderful? 
and I hope that it's going to be a blessing to you. So let me invite you to stand with me. We'll start in 2 Peter chapter 3, one verse, verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. The apostle Peter writes, but according to his promise, the Lord's promise, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, in which righteousness lives forever, in which perfection is the standard of heaven. We wait for a new heavens and a new earth, a better place. It's on the way. It's coming. And if you know Jesus, you're, you'll get to experience that. Will you pray with me? Father, this morning we, we're grateful for the opportunity we have again to open your word. We're thankful for the time of worship and for just the, just the, the, the collective spirit we have here that we are amazed at Jesus and what you do. Lord, we're so thankful for, for your love and your grace, your mercy, your salvation. Lord, nobody here has earned, deserved anything. Nobody here has earned anything from you. And yet you are so good, you're so compassionate that you love us with, a, with, a, with an unfailing love. In spite of all of our screw-ups and mistakes, Lord, you have set your love on us. And we're grateful that Jesus was moved by that love to go to the cross and to rise again and defeat death. So we have a future. God, we're grateful, and we pray that you would use this time and bless us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So again, there is a, a, a day ahead that we're waiting for, but every day that you live, your life is getting closer and closer to eternity. That, that, have you ever thought about that? That every day you are alive, you are one step closer to eternity. That's one less day you have here on this planet. That, that, that heaven or hell, depending on your relationship or your lack of relationship with Jesus, that that is moving at warp speed. We are, we are moving forward. It's always forward. There's no stopping time. There's no time standing still in, in, in this life. And yet, here's what we know, that death, the thing that a lot of people are afraid of, death is simply moving day. That that is a day where you will move, you will, you will be relocated. That death is simply the, the, the day that you are evicted from your temporary residence here and you enter into that permanent residence in eternity. That it's moving day. And so there's a better living arrangement, five pictures. Let me give them to you. Number one, heaven is a kingdom. Heaven is a kingdom. So I imagine that many, uh, maybe many of your children, you know, maybe you yourself as a little boy or a little girl, that you probably took some time as a kid and you took blankets, you took pillows, and you made a fort, right? Maybe you took some plastic swords or sticks or whatever, and, you, and, th and those were your weapons to do battle, and you were going to duel and you were going to protect your fort, Right? And, 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 and what I find striking about children doing that is, is that they're really practicing for heaven. That heaven is a kingdom. That we love royalty, right? We love kings and kingdoms and castles. We love those things. And that's partly because really we were made for something else, and that something else is the kingdom of heaven where there is a king. His name is Jesus. He will never be taken off the throne. There are no elections to, to determine his status in heaven, okay? He has conquered death. He's on the throne forever. And so, so, so we, as the children of God, get to reign with Jesus. That's in the New Testament, okay? Paul teaches that, that we'll, we'll even judge angels, right? And so Jesus is a king, He's got a kingdom. We get to belong to that kingdom. We have a role. We have a place in God's kingdom. Now check this out. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7 says, verse 12, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, meaning when you die, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Context. 
when David, the little shepherd boy, became the king of Israel, after he defeated Goliath, after all these crazy uh, family dynamics, and after running for his life from the current king Saul, after he becomes the king of Israel, God gave him a promise that there would be a greater king than David. David expanded the kingdom of Israel. He built it up. It was beautiful and ornate, and they were rich, and they were powerful. And yet God told David, David, you may be a great king, not a perfect king, but you're a good king, David, one of the best. But I'm going to raise up a perfect king, a better king, and his kingdom will never come to an end. That will be the Son of God. That will be Jesus Christ himself. That today, right now, here it is, July 17th, 2022, right now, as sure as we are alive, that Jesus is sitting on the throne of the universe, that he reigns and he rules over everything, that over heaven and earth, he's on the throne. He'll never be removed off the throne, that, there'll never, that there will be a day where we will have no more elections, no more politicians, no more votes. All those things are passing and fleeting. They're going away. There is only one person who will call the shots, and it'll be King Jesus. And so, so and, he, and, and the wonderful thing about King Jesus being on the throne and calling shots is that we're going to be happy about it right? Like we don't agree with a lot of decisions that get made, maybe in, in different, maybe it's your job, maybe in society, maybe, maybe some personal decisions you've made that you look back on and you go, ooh, I wish I would have done that differently, right? But we're, we are going to be perfectly content with Jesus and how he runs the universe. And so Daniel chapter 7, we have another description of the kingdom. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall never, shall not be destroyed. You know, one of the favorite titles that Jesus gave himself in the Gospels that he refers to himself as is the Son of Man. More than any other time, he could, he could have called himself the Son of God, and he does, but the number one way that he talks about himself is the Son of Man. Now, he, more than 80 times he does that, and he's making this connection here that Jesus is a king, he has power in a reign that will never end, that it will never be destroyed. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world with no nations, that there is just one kingdom, one ruler, there are no wars, there's no famine, there, there are enough resources for everybody to enjoy, there is total healing, there is real life. Can you imagine that type of world? That's called the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom is coming, and it's coming sooner than we believe it is. That that's the kind of place that we long for in this crazy world. That, that, that with all the chaos and all the instability, we have, mankind has not been able to build a perfect place. We have tried to build utopias. There are philosophies. There are theories. There are all, all these debates over how we can create a more perfect society, but we can't do that. We, don't have, we, we are incapable because of the sin that resides in our hearts and in the lives of other people. Even if we cooperated, we couldn't get other people to cooperate. And so, so we can't build that perfect utopia here. That's one reason why we have to keep the strategies and the politics and the business opportunities, keep all of those things in perspective. That ultimately what people are longing for when we think about pain and problems and we think about a desire for a better future, what we're longing for is really the return of Jesus Christ. We're really looking for him. That in due time, we belong to his kingdom and in due time, he will return and we will be there. So that's number one. Heaven's a kingdom. Number two, heaven is a city. Heaven is a city. In the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 2, 
when God, when God created Adam and Eve, they were loved and blessed by God. That's what the text says. And that they were set into a beautiful garden, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8 of Genesis. They were put into a beautiful garden. Now, we're going to talk about, more about gardens later. But humanity had done nothing to deserve the blessing and love of God, that God created us for a relationship with him, and he, and he put us in a perfect place like the Garden of Eden. We do not deserve this, and yet God gave this to us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says this, and God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. And check this out. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what this is, is this is what we, this is what we call a, a cultural mandate. In other words, God has created you. God created Adam and Eve. God created mankind to to, to multiply, have families. He created us to, 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 uh, to uh, build society that at this point in time when God created Adam and Eve, there was no city on the earth. It was just a garden. In the middle of the earth, there was a garden. And God calls us to be stewards. We have the responsibility to build homes, cities, make music, write stories, play, learn, flourish on the earth. That, that, that is part of what God created as his design on this, in life on this planet. And God decreed that mankind, we would develop this place. We'd multiply. I mean, think about it. We were, we were called to subdue the, the fish of the sea and, and the things that walk on the ground. It's like, why do, it's like when you go deer hunting, right? And it's like you're out there in the woods. There's, there's something I don't want to say magical about it, but there's something magical about it. There's something, something special about being out there or, or maybe spending time out on the lake or something like that. There's, there's something, there's something that, that, that we are hardwired for in a relationship with this creation. I'll get more about that in a second. But, but it, it's amazing how we kind of feel something special about creation in that way. That's because we were created to steward this place, to manage it, to to, to oversee it and, and to develop it. And we've done that, right? I mean, there are cities literally all over the world, right? However, what, what creating cities have done is it's created a longing for a better city. You know, I often heard in high school people would say, well, I can't wait to get out of Jefferson County. I can't wait to get away from East Tennessee, these bunch of backward podunk, you know, and like, it's like, I can't wait. I, I want to be in a big city, right? Like you want to live and there's lights and you're in like Atlanta or you're in New York City or you're wherever. And it's like, it, it's just party time all the time, right? People, people like, I, I want to get out of Eastern Tennessee. Like we, like, and I think what's happening is, I mentioned it last week, there's a restlessness in our hearts that we know there has to be a better place. That this place is not all that there is. There's got to be a better city, a better country, a better world to, that we, uh, we can live in. It's created a desire for something better. And, and, and that's what we see, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. It says that Abraham, verse 10 said, was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Man, think about Abraham, right? Whether you've been in church or not, no big deal. Let me set it up for you. Abraham is the, was the founding father of the people of Israel, the Jewish people. They didn't exist. God, God saw Abraham. He was a pagan. God set his love and salvation and grace on him, called him by his name, and said, I want you, 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 I'm going to bless you, and there's going to be a nation that blesses the world. It's going to be the people of Israel. Well, Abraham spent his life living in tents. Some of y'all can't make it a weekend. Some of, you, some, of, some of us go glamping, right? Because we actually can't go camping right? I mean, like, we actually can't pop the tent up and sleep in there. We go glamping. We got electricity, right? And so, and so Abraham, Abraham lived 
from, he, 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 would, he would pitch his tent, he would live there for a while, he would pick it up, he would sojourn and travel somewhere else, he would, he would set up his tent again, and that's how he would live. And he longed for something better. He knew that, that there had to be a better life. He knew that there had to be something else. He knew that there had to be a place. And as he's, as he's living and traveling and not, not really having a place to call home, it's hard when you're living in this world and you don't have a place to call home. Abraham is living his life and nobody, it, he's, he, can't, he can't put roots down anywhere. And, and there is something that sustained Abraham. That he knew there was a better, future with, a better future with God on the horizon. He knew that there was something up ahead of him and he desired a better city. He desired a place where he would belong. And that city is something that God invites us into that God dwells there and he wants us to live there with him as well Hebrews chapter 13 verse 14 I love this verse Hebrews 13 14 says for here meaning here on this earth like here for here we have no lasting city but we seek the city that is to come that, that, that we see economies fall, we see nations plunge into crisis, we face personal death and suffering, and it seems so unsettling to us, doesn't it? So unsettling. And yet we are sustained because our hope is not in this world, it's in a better one to come. That we know that God has us in the palm of his hand. That we are safe and secure. That God has planned a better future for us. That we will get to inherit and live in and enjoy forever. Right? And so, so we're looking for a city that's better than White Pine, Newport, Dandridge, Knoxville, Memphis, Nashville. Any, fill in the blank. All of those cities are flawed. They will not satisfy you. You'll think, man, if I get a fresh start in a big city, I'll, I'll be able to make something of my life. Maybe. Maybe. But maybe not. That's why our hope is not in these material things that we know, hey, listen, God provides opportunities, and at the same time, we keep, we're keeping the bigger perspective. God has our future. God has our future, and it's in a city with him. We're going to be relocated into a better place. Revelation 21 talks about the walls of the city of the new Jerusalem, the, the new heavens. The walls will be like jasper. The walls will be made of topaz. That the, that the streets will be like pure gold. But here's more, Revelation 21, verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and, and its lamp is the Lamb, meaning Jesus. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never shut, be shut by day, and there will be no night there. And they will, bring it into the, they will bring it into the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's a city. There's a city that we can belong to. That it, It's a place where it's so beautiful, streets of gold and walls of jasper, that it, it's a place so beautiful that, that, that we won't need the constellations and the and the, and the and the and the and the bodies and the planets up in the solar system, like sun, like the sun and the moon, and the stars. We won't need those things because the presence and the glory of Jesus alone will light up that city. Because He's the light of the world, isn't He? That's what He says. That that he, that he, he radiates the glory of God, and that it it, it makes things shine like this. That it's a place where nations will walk together in harmony. It's a place where we'll bring beauty and diversity into it. it says, he says that the gates of that city will be opened. When you go to bed tonight, you probably lock the doors of your home. You know why you lock the doors of your home? Because sin and evil exist. You lock the doors of your home because you have a right understanding that there is trouble in this world. That not everybody has your best, has your, is looking out for your, 
uh, looking out for your well-being. Not, not everybody has the best intentions about, about when, when, they, when they think of you or look at your house or think about your goods or whatever it may be. That you lock your doors at night because you know that, it's, that this world is not ultimately the safest place. But in the city of heaven, the gates, the doors will never be closed. That, that there will be nothing negative or evil or sinful there. There will be nothing detestable. That, that everything there will be pure and perfect and good and wholesome. It will be, be everything that we long for. That the gates are open, and, and, and the gates are open to show us that anybody who trusts and receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, anybody's welcome to come in. That what you do with Jesus in this life matters forever. And that, that the open door is an opportunity. It's a reminder that you can come in and you can trust Jesus and you can become a citizen of heaven. That, that in ancient times, in, a, in the ancient world, if you were a resident of a city, you would, your name would be placed on like a roll call, like, kind of like a, a private gated community. Y'all know I'm talking, y'all seen private gated communities, okay? And, and you got to press the little buzzer, or you got to have the little passcode. You press the little passcode, and, and the gates open up, and you get to go in, and, and you kind of feel like you're somebody, even though you grew up on C.H. Rankin Road in White Pond, and, and you kind of feel like, you kind of feel like, like maybe I, I really shouldn't belong here, but I'm here a little bit, you know? And, and so, like a gated community, like there's a, there's a little box and stuff. And so, that, that's for the people who live there. That's a very, that's a very special group of people who live there. Well, well in, in the city of heaven, there's the Lamb's Book of Life. And what you do with Jesus determines whether or not your name is there, that, that God has looked at you and God has said, you know what, on my team, and, and your name is put on that list. And so, when you arrive to heaven, it's like, who are you? And it's like, I, I'm, my name is Dustin Wallace. And and, and I, I know Jesus, and he knows me, and it's like, come on in, the, the, the doors are open, the gate is open for you. It's that kind of, it's that kind of opportunity, it's that kind of invitation, it's, it, it, it's a place where you can belong, that if you trust him and receive him as your Lord and Savior, meaning that you believe that he died on the cross for you, for your sins, and, and that he rose again from the grave, conquering sin, death, and hell, that you can be forgiven of your sin, and you can have a relationship with God, because God wants a relationship with you. And so, it, when you come to Jesus, you get placed on the roll call, and you become a citizen of that city. So it's a city that we have. We look forward to that place. Let me tell you a little bit about the city. And we'll talk more about this maybe next week, but, but it, it's a place where you have purposeful work. I told you last week that in heaven that, you were, that God created mankind to work and to rest, but work wasn't like tedious and tiresome like it, like it is now. It was productive and good and fruitful. There, there's purposeful work that you're going to learn and you're going to grow. There'll be opportunities for love and adventure. There'll be no more looting or dying or pain. That you'll go to dinners. There'll be concerts and festivals that that we'll get to go explore. I love to explore. On our honeymoon, we went to Washington D.C. Why? Well, number one, everything's just about free there in Washington D.C. Okay, and so um, so that's great, cool, right? Awesome. I love history, and so there's so much rich history and ornate buildings in the nation's capital, and all these monuments, and we got to go to the White House, and and I mean, and you and you look and you go, wow, you know, and you got, you just got to explore those things. We I love to do that. Um, we went to South Dakota. Uh, a few years back, I went to Mount Rushmore and saw the Badlands and a lot of the, the untouched Wild West out there, and how beautiful it was to look out and see farmland for miles and miles and miles. And, 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 just, and it was just, it was, a, it was, it was, it was so wonderful. It just captivated. Your mind started just filling up with possibilities about life and about creation and about the goodness of God. We uh, went to Charleston, South Carolina last year. And we, and we got to explore the history there. I told you, I, like I always say, I love history. And we got to explore the history there and, and, and walk around and see uh, different churches. And, and we got to go to, to the, the fort where the Civil War started and the history that was rich there. Like I love to see those things. I, I would love, it's always been a dream. I would love to go to Scotland and to be able to walk. I mean, Wallace, I mean, you know, William Wallace Braveheart. So uh, I don't know if there's a relation, but I'm claiming that there is one. So that's my guy, okay? We have the Wallace National Monument in Scotland. It's just, it's just like a, a tower, but it's mine, okay? And so it's the land of my people. So 
here, so like Scotland though, you like, you want to go and walk in Glasgow and Edinburgh, right? Like you want to, I want to go to Israel to walk the streets where Jesus walked and to see these places like the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And whether that happens in this life or the next one, that doesn't matter. What, what matters is that when we get to heaven, it's a city and we'll get to explore this brand new world. And we'll get to go, wow, look at how good our God is. Look at how amazing, look at the mind that he would create a masterpiece like this new world. We think this world's awesome, the next one's even better. It's a city. The third thing is that heaven is a home. Heaven is a home. You've heard expressions like, home is where the heart is. You've heard expressions that say things like, a house becomes a home when love moves in, right? Just me? Okay. So, all right, that's cool. I mean, I, I had no shame in it, okay? Maybe I see more like cross-stitching than you. I don't know. So, so, but a house becomes a home when love moved in, you know? And it's like, oh, it's great. It's like my people are here, and it's wonderful, right? Like, like that, that's our, our, our thought of, of home. Heaven is a home. Well, we will live with God that love has moved into that place, that love exists there, and we will enjoy it forever. Heaven is a home. We'll never be evicted. Ever been evicted? You'll never be evicted there. It's a safe place of love and friendship and, and peace. It's a place where you will, that, you, that you can live fully with no fear, in total freedom. And what's beautiful is, is that, you know, we make and we design and we build our homes here. You know, we, we, we have all these ideas. We, we, we look at blueprints. I love the bar dominium stuff. That's kind of like a fad trend thing. Bar dominiums are my jam, okay? And, and they're so customizable inside, and you look at them, and you're on the Instagram pages or Facebook, and you're like, wow, look at this one, and wow, look at this one. And it's so customizable. You know what I think that that, that, that does is, I, again, I think it creates a desire for, for, for a for a permanent home, like a real home, like a real home. Jesus talks about having a real permanent home, John 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Oh, Lord, our hearts are troubled. Pain, kids have cancer. I mean, the economy, you know, is difficult. I mean, you know, people aren't able to afford maybe, uh, you know, f food for their, for, for their families. I mean, things are hard. Let, but Jesus said, let your hearts not be troubled. Why should our hearts not be troubled, Jesus? Our hearts are troubled. Why should our hearts not be troubled? Believe in God, believe also in me. Okay? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Hey, you know what's beautiful? That while Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he reminds us that heaven is a home, that the picture is a big house, and there are so many rooms, so many rooms that you have, you have a spot there if you know Christ, that you have a place that your heavenly Father has created for you a permanent residence. You'll never have to move out. You'll never be able to not afford your mortgage or your rent, right? It's a place where it is secure, and you have a place there. And he's going to make sure that you get there. Can you imagine what it's like, what it would be like to live with Jesus? Can I tell you something? That he'll live at your house right now. You don't have to wonder what it will be like to live with Jesus. Sure, you'll get a fuller expression, a fuller picture of it, but he can, he, he can live in your house right now, that if you receive him as Lord and Savior, you can have him in your life, a real relationship. You can walk with him and spend time in his word and in prayer and in worship, and you can really experience the relationship God has for you. You can experience it. That Jesus will move into your house until you're ready to move into the Father's house. That's a gift. The Holy Spirit indwells in our hearts, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that he dwells in our hearts. That is a tent. It's a place where the Holy Spirit resides. That, that's why Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, because the presence of God is always with his children. 
Isn't that wonderful? He will, he will live with you right now until you're ready to go live with him. That in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, Paul says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, and it will be, guys. I mean, again, I told you, unless Jesus comes, Jesus comes back, it's a 100% likelihood that you're going to die. Ten out of ten people die. I hope that encourages you today, okay? I hope you're ready for that, right? That your earthly tent, this dwelling place, this, this body that's frail and scald all the imperfections that everybody else has, that this place will eventually be destroyed. Eventually, it, 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 it'll give way. It won't be able to sustain itself anymore. For we know that if, if, the, if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know what's wonderful is that we spend a lot of time trying to find the, the right house or whatever it may be. And you know, somebody said, when we, when we bought our first house, somebody said, you're going to realize that just because you bought a house that, that, that this journey has just started because there's always more upkeep, redecorating, maintenance. It never ends. And by the way, it never, it's crazy. Isn't it crazy how you can't, I mean, it just never goes away. It's always just like, attention, I got a problem. And you're like, what is going on in this house? And so, so as we look and as, as we build houses and we, and we fix and we improve things and, and, and we we, we, we are faced with the realities of imperfection. We're reminded that what God builds, what God builds is perfect. That God has a residence for us to experience now and in the future. And, I, and, I, and, and it, when our bodies give way, when our bodies give way and our, our little tents here, by the way, that's why they're called earthly tents, is because they're not permanent, right? And so, so, when your body gives way, you will step into the face-to-face -face presence of Jesus. You know, Paul says that we walk that right now we walk by faith, not by sight. Why does he say that? Because we don't see Jesus like face to face, right? Like, like I look at you, right? Like I'm not I, I'm not able to, to diagnose his eye color, okay? And so it's like I don't, you know, but we'll we'll see him face to face. And I thought about this. You know what makes heaven so glorious? It's not because the streets are gold. It's not because the walls are jasper and topaz and emerald and all these, other, all these other beautiful engravings and decorations. It's not because of all the beauty of heaven. The reason that heaven is so glorious, the reason that I want to be there is because Jesus is there. That what makes heaven heaven is Jesus. If he's not in heaven, he's somewhere else, I want to be there because that place is no longer heaven. Heaven is wherever he is. And he's the one that saved me. He's the one that's changed my life. I want to see him. So heaven, the reason heaven is, is such a wonderful home, a dwelling place, is because Jesus is residing there, and he resides there with us. That's the reason it's beautiful. That I want, we want to see him. And Revelation 22 says that we will see his face, verse 4. Revelation 21 says this, verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. What will heaven be like? Heaven's going to be, it's a home where you're in the same house as God himself. That it's a home where he will dwell with us. You know, it's a home, and what makes a home is that there are people that we love there. That you can live and have a house, but if the people you love there aren't there, something feels like it's missing. Heaven is a place for relationships. It's a place of peace. It's a place of joy. That I thought about this when we were in Charleston, South Carolina last year. That 
We took a horse and buggy tour. By the way, if you're ever in Charleston, do it, okay? Not like the spooky haunted tours. Those are cool, but they're kind of cheesy. There's a guy on the wall, and he's, he's, he's purple. Okay, cool. So, But like, take like the real historical tour, okay? And what, the, what you'll do is you'll ride in the horse and buggy, and you'll go around the, around the town, and, and they'll point out all kinds of cool things, Civil War-related things, uh, houses. Well, we came across to like the, the nice end of like of Charleston, like downtown, uh, like uh, Charleston, where like uh, there are these mega, mega expensive homes, so expensive that like they were advertised, like Tiffany's in New York would like advertise these homes, like real, real, real expensive stuff. And so we're there, and we come across the house, and it's like three of the most expensive homes in America. And we're there, and uh, one of the windows of a home there in Charleston had to be replaced. Window of a house. I don't know what kind of like efficient window setup you got in your home, but one window in this house in Charleston cost a million dollars. Okay? Right? I mean, now we're talking about elaborate, right? We're talking about fancy. We're talking about uh, this is the upper echelon of society that I'll never get into, right? I mean, this is unbelievable. We were there, and we stopped at, at a house, 42,000 square feet. Stopped at a house, 42,000 square feet. 42,000, right? Like, we, our houses are 1,000, 2,000. You know, we look at a guy with 5,000. We go, man, you got a big house, 5,000 square feet. What, kind of, what do you do for a living? You know what I mean? Like, 42,000 square feet. Had a chandelier imported from another country. Three million dollars. Chandelier. Not Lowe's Home Depot. Chandelier from another country. The diamonds were mined out of places that we've never heard of before. Right? I mean, it's incredible. Right? And we think, wow, what a, you open up a magazine and you, re, you look at it like Good Housekeeping magazine. You open it up and you go, wow, look at that home. Can I tell you something? Heaven is going to be even better than a $3 million chandelier in a house that's 42,000 square feet. It's going to be even better. It's a way better home that we have that, we're, that we get to inherit. It's a place where people and angels and other divine beings will be. It's a place where all nations, people from all nations who have lived and are trusted in Christ, they will live before the Lord it's a place that will represent cultures and languages. It's a place we'll be there together. It's going to be home, and we won't, we won't be restless like we are in this world. We will be settled. No more U-Hauls, no more, no more moving companies, that we will dwell in the Father's house, and that we will be in the palace where the king lives, that he, and he will dwell with us. That close proximity to God, that's what God originally planned for us. Heaven's a home. Fourth, heaven is a garden. Heaven is a garden. Heaven, follow this, heaven is a kingdom that has a city with a house that has a garden. God placed Adam and Eve in a garden, right? That's as simple as we go. Genesis 2.8, in a garden. He placed them in the garden. Ezekiel 28 talks about how beautiful the garden was, all the stones and all the engravings there. The Garden of Eden is where heaven and earth met, okay? And we were made to live in that perfect garden. Because we were created for that type of relationship with God and that type of relationship with the environment around us, we have a love for nature in a way that we can't really put our finger on. Like you go, you look, you see a beautiful golf course, you go, oof. I mean, how much, I mean, you look at that and you go, wow. I mean, how beautiful is that? You see, a, you see you, maybe you have a garden in your home and you grow things and, and, and you, you appreciate the, the, the opportunity in that setup. That it's, why, it's why we take our family vacations to lakes or mountains. It's why we take pictures of flowers that bloom and, and leaves that change color. It's why that <clears throat> one of my, like, you know, the other day we were fishing in kayaks on, on, on a river. And it's like, you know, in that early morning when the, before the sun gets up and, you know, and it's not high yet, you know, and it's not hot yet. And, uh, and, and, and the, like the fog is lifting up off the lake and it, it's, it's calm and it's beautiful, right? One, one of my favorite places to be, and praise the Lord, it's coming up soon. One of my favorite places to be is in a deer stand, okay? And I love being in the woods, getting in there when it's dark, when it's dark and there's nothing going on. And then you're sitting up there and you, and you, you climb up and, 
you hope I made too much racket, you know, and, and you, just get, you, just, you just sit up there, and it's like the sun rises over the canopy of the trees, and you start to hear like squirrels and birds begin to, begin to move and communicate, and it's like all of creation wakes up around you in, in that moment, and it's so tranquil. It's so, I don't have, I can't describe it. It's so peaceful that I, it just, it's just, I feel like somebody once said that you're, that a, 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 a hunter in a tree stand is 20 feet closer to God. I feel like, you know, you're up in a tree and it's so relaxing. I love that feeling in, 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 in that morning. If I don't see anything, I just love being there. It's, it, it's almost magical, right? Like we were made for that. I mean, like I mentioned leaves turning color. People take trips to Gatlinburg from out of state just to see the leaves change color, right? I mean, like we love to admire the beauty of creation. Why? Because we were made and placed into a garden. And that garden was perfect and beautiful. It was life-giving. It was something that was, it was majestic. God was there in that garden. Now, sin displaces us from that beautiful world, but the garden was paradise. In Luke 23, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And there's a thief on a cross right next to him. Luke 23, verse 42. There's a thief on the cross next to Jesus. And before they die, there is a clear distinction between Jesus and this thief. The thief is guilty and he deserves to die, but Jesus is there. He's innocent. He chose to die. Big difference. And this thief looks at Jesus on the cross and he recognizes there is something different about this man next to me on the cross. That he's heard all the mockery of him being the king of the Jews. They've heard, he's heard all the mockery of people calling him a savior. And he, he looks at Jesus and he says something so simple. He says this, verse 42. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know what that word paradise means in the original Greek? Garden. Garden. Paradise is a garden place. That this guy is going to die, and his response in the moments before he dies is to trust, put his trust in Jesus Christ, and Jesus tells him, where you're about to go is so delightful, so beautiful, I will see you there. Could you imagine? Jesus is like, Jesus gets, the, he's in paradise, and like here comes like walking behind him, unsure, here comes like the thief that was on the cross. He's like, I don't really think I should be here. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not sure how I got here. I don't know, you know, I don't know. I mean, this place is sob, nicer than any place I've ever robbed from. I mean, this place is unbelievable. And people are like, there's Jesus. Who's that guy? Hey, I'm with this guy. I don't know. I'm just here, right? Like, you just following him in, you know? It's like, it's amazing. It's a beautiful place. It's a garden place. It's a, the, it's a place where God originally created. The same thing is true for us, that there's a paradise. There's a beautiful garden place that we get to inherit, that we'll get, we, we get the paradise of heaven when we die. That Jesus tells the church in Revelation 2, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Hey, you believe in Jesus, you persevere, you keep on going, you don't walk away. You keep trusting, you keep believing, he's got you secure in his hands. When you arrive at the finish line of life, there's a paradise waiting, and there's a tree there. Now, Adam and Eve were told in the original garden, you can't eat of that tree. That tree of life, if you eat of it, you'll be stuck in your sin, forever disconnected from God. But for us, it's a tree of blessing. It's a tree of eternal life. It's a tree of life, of full life, that we will live fully and forever, and we will live in real freedom, and we will enjoy everything, everything there is to enjoy about Jesus and about his new world. So what God has in store for you is better than you can even imagine. It's a garden. It's a paradise place. Better than the places you go on cruise, right? You go down to Cabo. 
you're, 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 on a, you're on a catamaran sailing around St. Martin, okay? Even better. You go, man, this is paradise. You're Instagramming. Oh, another day in paradise, Amen. right? Another day in paradise, right? That's, that's us, right? Heaven's even better. Even better. It's a garden. And the last thing is this, that heaven is a never-ending party. You like parties? People like parties. People are made to party, okay? People like parties. Birthday parties, weddings, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, 4th of July, any reason we had to celebrate, we, we find a reason to party, right? And so Jesus, I believe, enjoyed parties. His first public miracle was at a party. It was a week-long wedding. By the way, we, we have a wedding. We have like, you know, you have, a, you have a wedding. You have the rehearsal dinner the night before. You have a wedding. You have the reception. You go home, right? So if you're a wedding guest, you might be there. If you go to the wedding and the, and the reception, you might be there for a few hours and you're done, right? But weddings back in Jesus' day were week-long festivals. You started like on Sunday and you partied all week, right? And so you're going and you're celebrating bride and groom. It's like, boom, another day. Boom, here they are. They're married. Huh? They're married. They did it. They tied the knot. Here we are again, right? And so that's the party, okay? And here Jesus is in John chapter 2. There's a wedding. There's a wedding that happens there. It's a week-long celebration, and his first miracle is that he turns wine in, uh, water into wine. Why would he do that? Because wine is often associated as a picture of joy. I put some Bible verses in your notes. That it's incredible. If you, do, if you study the Old Testament, how connected wine is to both the Holy Spirit and to joy. There's a connection there. And so here's, what, here's what's going on here. Jesus is often gathering around people, and usually people are celebrating. People who are blind get to see again. People who are deaf get to hear again. People who are crippled get to walk again. That there was people who were starving got fed. I mean, you know, it's, and he, Jesus is preaching, and people are following. And it's, it, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a celebration. People are dragging their neighbors out going, hey, come meet this guy. Heaven is a forever party. And let me say this. One of the lies, and it's a lie, and I want you to understand this very clearly. One of the lies of the enemy, one of the lies that Satan, for some reason, is able to, to share and promote in a way that seeped down into the hearts and minds of people, which is totally fabricated, that one of these, one of these lies is a smear campaign that says that heaven is the, uh, that hell that hell is the cool place where there everybody gets to smoke cigarettes and, and listen to heavy metal music, and it's just it, it's just uh, it's just it's 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 the, it's the happening place to be. It's full of life and it's awesome. And then heaven's kind of boring. We look like chubby children in diapers that we we play we play harps and instruments and we sit around on little clouds and that's all we do. We look like little cupids up on clouds. That that people think that's what heaven is, and people rather go whom do I want to be a chubby child in a diaper uh, with with little wings and just kind of, you know, doing my little, doing my thing, playing a little heart or a flute or whatever? Or do I want to be, like, cool? Do I want to be, like, in hell where everybody's kind of rock and rolling, right? Like, like and that, that has permeated the hearts and minds of people, and that couldn't be further from the truth. That hell is a place of torment. That sin is dealt with, whether you deal with or you let Jesus deal with it, sin is going to be dealt with. That's that place. Heaven is the place of party and celebration. Heaven is the place of joy. Heaven is the place where your heart explodes with real happiness and joy. That heaven is, it, every day in heaven is a celebration of the grace of God. Man, I can't believe we made it here. I mean, there Jesus is. Wow. You know, and you'll go, wait a second. And you have a million, countless reasons to be joyful. It's a real party. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 2, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. It's a feast. It's a feast. It's a party that never ends. That Jesus is the, is, is the, is, is the groom. The church is the bride. We come, that in heaven we will celebrate the love, the strong, deep, faithful, unfailing love of Jesus. It's a joy. That, that we celebrate those occasions. 
that we love concerts. We love celebrations where everybody's loud and their spirits are up because we were made for joy. We were made for worship, made for celebration. And that on, in, that on, in that day when all of God's people arrive in heaven, on that day when every last one of his sheep make it there, there's going to be a wedding. Matthew chapter 11 says, the, or, uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 19, excuse me. Revelation chapter 19 says this, verse 6, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. Sounds like thunder. Doesn't seem too quiet and boring to me. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The church is there. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. I want you to think about, hey, listen, you, be, you go to a UT football game or wherever team you pull for, there's tailgate parties, right? You know, and there's music, and there are people, I mean, people are playing cornhole, and things are going crazy, right? And you're excited, and you're, then you're in Neyland Stadium, right? And you got 100,000 of your closest friends just screaming Rocky Top at the top of their lungs, and there's something about that energy and that crowd that, you know what, you're down, I mean, you're getting stomped into the dirt, which is what happens half the time. And we get just get stomped, and it hurts, and we're mad. If we're not there, we turn the TV off, turn it back on because we can't stand it. Like we like watching us lose because we're gluttons for punishment. So, so you're there, and you're in Neyland Stadium. There's tailgate party, and now you're here, and you're chanting. It's great to be a volunteer. It's not always, but we'd say it anyway. And so you're singing it, and people around you are going crazy, and you're high, touchdown, you're high-fiving people, right? And it's incredible, and you're like, man, you feel like you're on top of the world, right? There's, it's electric, right? We love stuff like that. We love being at concerts when, like, Maybe like, it, it, like the, 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 the singer backs out or, or maybe it's an acoustic set and you hear the whole crowd begin to sing in unison to this, like this main hook or line of a chorus and everybody's like, yes, and it's like magical, right? The lights are low and everybody's got their phones out and they're waving them in the air. You got a little flashlight on your phone or maybe your old school cigarette lighter if you're allowed in, right? Okay, and it's like, and it's magical, Right? It's because you were made to celebrate and be joyful. It's just because you were made for a party. And heaven is that party where we will see Jesus and go, wow, hey, you know what? Let's celebrate. Let's do it. It's nonstop. It's always on the go. Every day is that kind of energy. Every day is that celebration. It's a party. Church, you were made for a better world. You were made for a better world. And everything that's, gone, everything that's gone wrong in this life will be no more. And everything that's gone right here, everything beautiful, everything good, everything true, will be multiplied times infinity in heaven. You were made for this world. The question is, is do you personally know Jesus? Is this your future? And if not, today it can be. Will you stand with me? As we bow our heads, if you are here this morning...